introduction to the emphasis on why it's a hard subject. Sure. Does that work? Okay. So last time I gave an introduction to canonical quantum gravity describing ideas. By the way, I'm, I'm hardly ever giving any references or credit to anybody in this talk because it would slow things down a lot, but those were ideas developed by Wheeler and DeWitt in the early 60s and worked out in more detail by Arnowitz, Desert, and Misner. Well, they were based on ideas by, by those uh, three, and then uh, a lot of people clarifying them in various directions. But basically, uh, <clears throat> that approach to canonical quantum gravity ran into great difficulty for a number of reasons, one of which was that we couldn't figure out how to define L2 of the space of all Riemannian metrics on a three-manifold. It's a very large space, and it's hard to uh, find nice measures on such large spaces. And so at that point, that program sort of got stuck. And so I hinted at the end last time that the way to get around this is to describe general relativity in some new variables in which the metric is not the star of the show anymore, but instead an SU2 connection is the star of the show, actually a connection on the spin bundle of our three manifold. And I won't say more about how that works yet. I'll say more about that next time, what these new variables are. But now I want to introduce the mathematical machinery that will allow us to define L2 of the space of connections in this kind of situation. And so I'll start out by talking about L2 of the space of connections on a graph. <coughs> so we're going to do what physicists sometimes call lattice gauge theory, where instead of modeling space as a manifold, you model it as a graph. And physicists often, for calculational purposes, will model it as a graph that's just like a, a rectangular lattice. But for us, the graph can be more flexible. It can be any sort of graph. And then we'll see that in that situation, there's a very pretty definition of what a connection is, what a gauge transformation is, and a very nice measure on the space of connections, also on the space of connections mod gauge transformations. And I'll show you that L2 of the space of connections mod gauge transformations has a very explicit orthonormal basis, a basis of things we call spin networks. Then using this technology, we can go up and try to do gauge theory on a manifold. So but we'll start out here with gauge theory on a graph. So this is presumably why I got invited to this conference. That there, there's something about graphs going on here. So <clears throat> graphs mean lots of slightly different things, but here a graph will just be a finite set of edges, E, a finite set of vertices, V, and source and target maps, S and T, from E to V, which assign to each edge its source, starting point, and target. So that's a very simple structure. It's actually sort of amusing that graph theory, if you're studying these sort of graphs, it's really just the theory of pairs of functions with the same source and same target. Once I asked some students of mine, which huge collection of people study pairs of functions with the same source and target weren't able to figure it out. It's just graph theory. Um, so dynamics. <laughs> <laughs> that's one function. With a no, no, no. Because you have two spaces. Two. Oh, that type of dynamics. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Well, that's that explains, I guess, what's going on with this. Uh, this uh, <laughs> now I finally understand. <laughs> so, um, so given a graph and fixing a group, we can define the notion of a connection on that graph, gamma, and all it will be is just a map assigning to each edge an element of the group, which we call the holonomy along that edge. So we just imagine that you can parallel transport things along edges and that parallel transport operation is just an element of the group. Uh, we can also similarly define a gauge transformation, and that's also equally simple-minded. It's just a function from the vertices of our graph 
to the group. And the point is that gauge transformations act on connections then in the usual way. So there's a standard formula in the case of connections on manifolds about how a gauge transformation affects the holonomies along paths. And we just steal that formula and make it into a definition here that the gauge transformation G acts on the connection A to get a new connection by essentially conjugating it, in a sense, multiplying it on, the, on one side by the inverse of the group element and on the other side by the group element itself. So we have the group element at the source, the group element at the target appearing here and here. So that's, that's just the way it would be if you were talking about holonomies and how gauge transformations act on holonomies. So this is a very simple-minded setup. And we can do some things with it. So let's make up some notation. Let A be the space of all connections on our graph. So that's just G to the E, one group element for every edge. And let big fancy curly G be the set of all gauge transformations on this graph. So that's just G to the V, one group element for each vertex. And now let's suppose that our group has a measure on it, which is invariant under both right and left translations. So that will be the case in many situations. For example, if G is a compact topological group, um, in which case you often call that R measure. And in any event, when we have that situation, then the space of connections automatically gets a measure, just the product measure, because it's a product of copies of G. So you just put the product measure on that. And then the group of gauge transformations will act in a measure-preserving way on that space of connections, because the formula for how gauge transformations act on connections just involves right and left translations. So, so then, using this measure, we can define the Hilbert space, L2 of A, and because this group is acting as measure-preserving transformations of space of connections, it'll act as unitary operate. It'll have a unitary representation on this Hilbert space. So that's the sort of thing one always hopes for in, in physics, that gauge transformations would act as symmetries on the uh, Hilbert space associated to the connections, L2 of the connections. We can also talk about L2 of the space of connections mod gauge transformations, and that's equally easy because we have this map from the space of connections to the space of connections mod gauge transformations, just assigning, assigning each uh, connection to its equivalence class. And you can push forward measures by maps. So you get a measure on A mod G, and so you can talk about L2 of A mod G. And there's a nice way to think about what... So, G has to be a compact group now, for a finite volume. Uh, this is a uh, uh, What business about product measures? You can talk about a product of two measures. Yes, how about a product of two measures? E is a finite set. Finite, finite, oh. finite set. Oh, these are finite. <laughs> yes. So you are allowed to ask me questions about whether things converge and whether things are well defined. <laughs> and, and, you're, and you're encouraged to do so because, in fact, I should say that the attitude, which, the difference in attitude here is that in ordinary quantum field theory, you can do lots of experiments to check your calculations so that even if you step on lots of mathematicians' toes, as long as you get a number that you can compare with the experiment, you feel okay. But in quantum gravity, there are no experiments currently. And so it's my attitude, which I'm not attempting to pose on anyone else, that in such a situation, you have to be very careful about mathematical rigor. That's sort of the only uh, constraint on your activity. And, and apart, from, well, apart from trying to do a good job of, of modeling physics. And so I'm trying, oh, what, what all this is supposed to be is a rigorous uh, way of defining things. Um, let's see, but well, should I worry about Dennis's question? Yeah, yeah I should. Yeah, okay, I now I got myself into it. Good, yeah. why? I don't quite see why. Whenever you have a, this is just, this will always be some map, 
can always push forward a measure. I guess you just might worry that this measure that you've gotten when you pushed forward is a very stupid measure, like a measure that assigns infinity to certain points. So I suppose that's the bad thing that could happen if G were not compatible. Yeah. So you have like this vibration, it's not a mass spread all over. Right. Right. So the measure, I think if G is not compact, you still get a measure. It's like taking the measure of the plane and pushing it down to the line. What does that mean? Yeah. Well, what it means is you get a really obnoxious measure that assigns infinity to every single point on the line. Yeah. So, so in other words, yeah. So in other words, this, I think this is all still true in the case when G is not compact, but it's going to be stupid, except when G is compact. And pretty soon I'm going to just restrict to having G be compact. So to make it interesting, G should be compact. But I don't think I'm actually lying. I'm just, yeah, it, I'm, I'm just get a, a measure that assigns infinity to individual points on here if she's not compact. So, so L2 of the space of connections mod gauge transformations, you can check, is isomorphic to just a subspace of L2 of the space of connections. And it's just the G invariant subspace, the space that's invariant under all gauge transformations. And all you do is sort of check that. Well, you know, the obvious idea to check that is if you have a function, an L2 function from A mod G to the complex numbers, you can use this little diagram here to define a function on the space of connections, which is G invariant, and you can check that the norm of that. Check that that will be in L2 if and only if that is in L2. Yeah, it's only interesting when G is compact. So now you see I break down and admit it. G is compact. Okay. <clears throat> so this is one reason why why we're going to uh, be so interested in SE2 connections instead of connections with some group like the Lorentz group is as the gauge group, because we want to be able to use this technology. So if G is compact, then it does have a unique Borel measure that's left and right invariant and is normalized so that the total measure of the group is one. That's our normalized par measure. And in this case, what's nice is that you can really get a very explicit description of L2 of the space of connections on our graph, and also L2 of the space of connections mod gauge transformations. So here what I'm going to start doing is a bunch of manipulations to describe L2 of these spaces in various ways. And the basic tool is this wonderful Hader-Weil theorem, which describes L2 of a compact group um, in terms of the irreducible representations of the group. So let irrep G be the set of equivalence classes of irreducible representations of G. Let's make them be unitary. And so, so pick one representation from each equivalence class. And so uh, we, we form for each irreducible representation, rho tensor rho star. We take the direct sum of all of those. And that's isomorphic to L2 of G. And in fact, it's much better than just an isomorphism of Hilbert spaces. In fact, as we'll need later, so G acts by right and left translations here. So this is really a representation of G cross G. And these guys are also representations of G cross G. Because you can get a representation of a product of two groups by tensoring representations of the two groups. So both sides are really representations of G cross G, and they're isomorphic in that way, not just as vector spaces. So we'll, we'll be using this basic theorem to describe L2 of the space of connections very explicitly. So here we go. So here's how it goes. Wait, wait. Could you first explain sure. how this, uh, on the left, you have functions from G yeah. to R with some, right? And what's up? So what, how, how do you interpret what's on the right as, as function? So if I have an element of rho tensor rho star, and I'm feeling lowbrow, I can think of that as a matrix, right? And <coughs> So I can think of it as a 
So, so I just need to think of how, how do I take those matrices and think of them as functions of, of G? Well, if I have an irreducible representation of G, you can think of it as a thing that assigns to each element of G a matrix. And I could, for example, if I wanted, I could take each matrix entry and that would define a function on G. I'm not explaining it terribly well. but So if rho is n-dimensional, this is an n-squared dimensional space whose basis can be thought of as matrix entries. Each of those matrix entries becomes a function on G just by taking this representation rho, applying the representation to it, and figuring out what that matrix entry is. Does that make sense? OK. Yeah, so that's, that's the proof of the pater vial theorem, basically. I mean, that's, the, that's the idea behind it, how you get this isomorphism. We won't really even need to know that, but, but yeah, that's, that's the heart of why it works. <clears throat> so, so we start out with L2 of the space of connections. Space of connections is just a product of copies of G. So it's just L2 of G to the E. But L2 of a product of spaces is just the tensor product of the L2s. So we can think of it as a tensor product over all edges in our graph of copies of L2 of G. So then we can hit that description with a pater vial theorem. And so we get this more uh, fancy expression here, tensor product over edges of a direct sum over irreducible representations of rho tensor rho star. Then I can basically use the distributive law, distributivity of uh, tensor product over direct sum to flip this uh, flip these two guys around, the tensor and the direct sum, and think of it this slightly different way. We can think of it as a direct sum of all ways of labeling each edge with an irreducible representation of the tensor product over edges E of rho E tensor rho E star. So the rho sub E is the representation labeling the edge E. So it, it, this becomes a lot clearer if you just consider a puny little example and you just see that you use the distributive law. <coughs> you get that. Okay, so that, that's about as nice as it gets. Now I'm going to make it more complicated and messy for my next task, which will be to describe L2 of the space of connection mod gauge transformations. So I'm going to manipulate this a little bit further in the following way. So here we have a tensor product over all edges. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite it as a tensor product over all vertices. So I, for each vertex V, there will be some set of edges that have it as its <coughs> target. I'll call those the incoming edges coming into it. And it also has a set of outgoing edges. So what I can do is take the tensor product over all vertices of a bunch of copies of rho E star for all the incoming edges coming into V, tensor, the tensor product of a bunch of rho E's, where E are all the edges going out. So you see that manages to account for all the factors of rho E and rho E star that we have up here, because a typical one of these guys would be rho E for some edge E. Well, that edge will be coming into some vertex or other, one unique vertex, and so we just put it into there. Similarly, we put these guys into here. So this is a, well, this is a more complicated way of describing the same thing, which we're going to need for the next step. So the next step is to get a very explicit description of L2 of the space of connection mod gauge transformations. So as I mentioned, G cross G acts on L2 of G by right and left translations, respectively. The two factors act by right and left translations, respectively. And the pater vial theorem is really just telling you how it goes. So as I said, all these guys are really representations of G cross G. They're really irreducible representations of G cross G, in fact. And so is this. And 
an isomorphism. And so this is, so this sort of really tells us how the group acts on L2 of G, and that's what we need to know to understand how the gauge group acts on the space L2 of a space of connections. So here I'm writing down this big fat formula that I wrote down at the end of the last transparency, where I'm writing L2 of the space of connections as a direct sum over all ways of labeling edges by irreps, and then a tensor product over all vertices of this stuff. Now, how does a gauge transformation act on this space? Well, a gauge transformation, remember, is just something that assigns to each vertex one group element. And, well, maybe you'll take my word for it, maybe you won't, but the way that the gauge group acts on this is that each of these particular group elements, G sub V, act on one of these factors here, one of the stuff in square brackets, gets acted on by G V in the obvious way. In other words, this is a, this is, you can interpret this big thing as a representation of G, and G sub V just, you just stick G sub V into that representation, and that's how it acts. So it acts on each factor. Yeah, each G sub V acts on one of these factors in an interesting way, and trivially on all the rest. Oh, so it acts on only one factor. Each, each G sub V just acts on one factor. So remember, a gauge transformation is a whole bunch of G sub Vs. I know, I know. Yeah. How does one G sub V act? One G sub V acts, G sub V acts on you pick out your particular V sure. here, and it acts in via this representation on that, trivially on all the rest, all but the other on, factors. On each factor in there, it acts as it should. On each factor at the vertex, it acts on, it acts on each factor. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So you can you can see this oh, if you that. stare at all these formulas for a while, so that. The action of the gauge transformations on the connections was multiplying on the left by a group element and on the right by a group element inverse. And that sort of gets translated into this uh, representation, a dual representation thing that we've got here. Yeah, so you just have to think about that a while. So, so, so now what's L2 of the space of connections mod gauge transformations? Well, as I said, you can think of vectors in here as vectors in here that are invariant under all gauge transformations. So we just need to look at here and see which vectors will be invariant under the action of every gauge transformation. And what we'll get is just those vectors sitting inside here. Well, we to understand it, we need to understand the vectors sitting inside here on which G acts trivially. So let me just use inv blah -de blah to describe the vectors in this representation here on which G acts trivially. So the invariant subspace of this representation. So that will be the subspace of this on which G sub V acts trivially. So if we take the tensor product over all vertices and sum over all labelings, then we'll get the space of all vectors in here on which gauge transformations act trivially. So this is uh, this is this is L2 of A mod G. Another way to think about this invariant subspace is to think of it as a space of intertwining operators. An intertwining operator from B to W is the same thing as an invariant vector in B star tensor W. Or if you're dealing with unitary representation, it's what also intertwining operators. Okay, sorry. Um, yep. So say B and W are representations of some group. A linear operator will be an intertwining operator. Well let me I need well I know. It'll be an intertwining operator if you can first act on a vector in B then apply the operator, and it's the same thing as if you first applied the operator and then acted on the resulting vector in W. So it's the natural notion of a map between linear representations of a group. 
So, so that's an intertwining operator, but it's also another way to think about that is that it's an element of V star tensor W, which is invariant under the action of G on this tensor product of two representations. So that's another way to think about it. And if you're dealing with unitary representations, as we are here, you could also think about it as an element of this, basically by taking its adjoint. The adjoint of a map from V to W will be a map from W to V, so you can also think of it like this. This is perhaps a stupid extra twist to stick into the story. The only reason why I do this last extra twist down here is because I sort of feel psychologically happier about thinking about these intertwining operators as going from the tensor product of representations labeling the incoming edges to the tensor product of representations labeling the outgoing edges. So that what I think of an element of this space as being is a little operator sitting at this vertex which eats a bunch of vectors coming in living in these representations and spits out a tensor product of vectors going out, living in these representations. These representations labeling the outgoing edges. So, so what we've got here is a description. It's backwards on purpose, right? That, that, it's backwards because I pulled this silly trick. Here, you see? Yeah, so is that what you're referring to? <laughs> okay, I got caught in my own, I got caught in my own uh, cleverness, yes. So this letter here was supposed to be a T, and that was supposed to be an S, which does not obviously match this above expression, but matches it when you pull this stunt. Do that trick. Yes, I'm sorry. So that is a T, it just looks like an S, and that is an S. <laughs> Looks like it's T. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. It's just, well, this is the one sneaky, niggly little thing that's really minor point that I always get tripped up on, and now I'm doing it to you. Okay, so we have a description of L2 of the space of connections mod gauge transformations in the following way. Now we label, to get vectors in here, we label each edge with an irreducible representation and label each vertex with an intertwining operator. So that's the idea of spin networks. I'll make that more clear, I hope, now. So what we've proved is this little theorem, theorem about the spin network basis, and it goes like this. So if gamma is any graph, and she's a compact group, we can get an orthonormal basis of this L2 of the space of connections mod gauge transformations. And the way we get it is we just go around <clears throat> to get elements of this orthonormal basis. We just go around labeling each edge by an irreducible representation, rho sub e, chosen from our list of all irreducible representations. And we label each vertex by an intertwining operator from the tensor product of representations labeling the incoming edges to the tensor product of representations labeling the outgoing edges. And we choose those intertwiners to run over an orthonormal basis of this space of intertwiners. So that's, yeah. T is target. So, so, so I managed to confuse all of this, yeah, so. So these are the edges that have T of E equal V for coming in. These are the guys that have S of V, S of E equals V. They're going out. And so we just have an intertwining operator here for the tensor product of the representations labeling all these guys to the tensor product of the representations 
labeling these guys. So it's supposed to be obvious, it's supposed to be memorable when you're done that, that you sort of think of this intertwining operator as taking in a bunch of these things and spitting out a bunch of those things. So, so this data that we're using to label this orthonormal basis is what I call a spin network. It's like so, the interaction, right? I mean, you wouldn't know what to do if things would come in and it right. tells you how to make it interact. Yeah. You get the output. Yeah. And maybe I should just point out, since it's sort of related to what we were talking about in the last talk, that a Feynman diagram can be thought of as a special case of a spin network. Misha wasn't bringing in a group action. But if you had a group acting on everything in sight, then his graphs could often be interpreted as spin networks. So I'll, I'll try to make that a little clearer later. But, but that's right. So <clears throat> all the uh, usual Feynman diagram technologies is very closely related to these spin networks. So a spin network, to be painfully clear, is a choice of a graph, a labeling of each edge of the graph by impurities for representation of our chosen group, and labeling of each vertex by an intertwining operator like this. And so, well, I've already proved this theorem. The proof of the theorem is just this uh, formula that I wrote down last time on the last transparency. So, so I, I suppose you could generalize that. I mean, this is like a basis spin network, but to, to use them, you could put any representation yeah. in any of the quantum. That's true. And, network. Yeah, and that can yeah. often be very handy to do. Yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah, so there's no reason in the definition to, to insist that they be irreducible. It's only if you want to get a basis that you pick the irreducible ones. That's right. Yeah, if you do what Dennis is suggesting, then you can actually tensor or spin networks, get new spin networks. It's nicer in a lot of ways. Let me also do the direct on all possible. Right, it has as an orthonormal basis all possible spin networks. That's sort of another way to say what you said. Uh -huh. So let's do some examples. So let's start out with a nice, easy example, the example where the group is U1, the circle. So this example is relevant to electromagnetism where the gauge group is U1. So there's <coughs> Z's worth of irreducible representations of our group in that case, and they're called charges in the applications to electromagnetism. This is quantization of charge. And these irreducible representations just work like this. The nth one applied to the element of U1 called e to the i theta is just e to the i n theta. So it's a one-dimensional irreducible representation. You get one for each integer. And the rules for tensoring and dualizing these representations are really just the rules for so you mean it's multiplication by e to the i and theta on the one dimensional space? Right, yeah. So I, yesterday I was talking to someone who said he had an argument with a physicist as to whether a number was the same thing as a one by one matrix. And I wasn't sure who was on which side of that argument. I was trying to guess. But anyway, yeah, so that, that's the sin I'm giving in here, right? This is a one by one matrix of our linear transformation, multiplication by that number. Yeah. Um, so the rules for tensoring and dualizing these reps are as follows. It's easy to work out. You tensor the nth and the mth one, you get the n plus mth one. The dual of the nth one is the minus nth one. So it's just the fancy way to say it is the point Pointryagin dual of u1 is z. And so using these rules, we can easily see what the space of intertwining operators, I'm going to start calling them intertwiners for short, what the space of intertwiners is in any case. So suppose you have a bunch of incoming edges labeled by these representations or integers n1 through nk and a bunch coming out labeled by integers m1 through ml. Well, you can just take the tensor product of all these representations and it will just be the representation n1 plus n2 plus da 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 plus nk. And similarly for here, so by Schur's lemma, you'll get a one-dimensional space of intertwining operators if those two sums agree, and a zero-dimensional space otherwise. So in this particular case, you don't really need to do much to label the vertices by intertwining operators. There either is one, if this condition is met, that is, there's, there's a 
one dimensional space of them, so you just pick one, use that. And there's a zero dimensional space otherwise. So, so you have to choose a phase. Then. You gotta choose a phase, yeah. There is a sort of uh, there is a canonical uh, best can. one in this case. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, now you asked me about SE2. How do you choose a canonical intertwiner? Now, I'm not going to worry much about that, but if you really wanted to do calculations, you'd like to have a nice best basis vector for this one dimensional space of intertwining operators. I think there is a canonical best one here. But anyway, we'll just pick one. So. So in this particular case, L2 of the space of connections mod gauge transformations has a nice basis. It's sort of silly to call them spin networks in this case. They're called spin networks because the original group that people thought about this stuff for was the group SU2, where the representations go by the name of spins. Here, they should probably be called something like flux networks because what they are is just ways of labeling these edges by integers with a condition that the sum of the integers labeling incoming edges at any vertex equals the sum of the integers going out. And the physical meaning of this really is that these are electric field lines marching along these edges and the condition that they sum correctly is really a discretized version of Gauss's law that the divergence of the electric field is zero much electric field has to be leaving each vertex as is coming in. So in general, actually, there's a deep relation between Gauss's law and its generalizations to other gauge theories and gauge invariance. Then we be You could reinterpret it. That would be a, that's not quite the way I want to think about it, but you could also use this to study flow of current if the current were quantized for some reason, which it is sometimes, yeah. Um, yeah charge is quantized. I don't know if current is quantized. Sometimes it might be. Um, but notice here, I don't really want to use that interpretation because I'm, what I'm doing is I'm studying gauge theories without matter, that is, without charged particles. I'm only studying the electromagnetic field by itself. I'm not studying any electrons. So this, the, these, line, these numbers really don't have the meaning of current in this particular setting, although you're right that it's another use of the same technology. They really have the meaning of electric flux, electric field flowing along a, an edge here. And this is really Gauss's law not Kirchhoff's law, but you can reinterpret it all that way. It's, the, reason why I want to, the reason why I want to stick to this interpretation is because um, if, you pay, if you paid really careful attention last time, you would have noticed that the thing I called the diffeomorphism constraint, one of the constraints in gravity, it had a somewhat similar look to this. And we'll be seeing this type of constraint various other contexts will be clearest when we work, go over to the connection description of a general relativity. So anyway, here it's just showing up in a simple-minded way for electromagnetism. So the next group, you know, my, and the last group that I'll talk about, is SU2. So this is the gauge group for two forces in nature, maybe. Weak force, for sure, and gravity in one of its descriptions, this new variables description that I'm going to talk about. So here the irreducible representations just correspond to the natural numbers that this is likely to divide by 2 and call those spins, 0, 1 half, 1, and so on. So the spin j representation is just the 2j plus 1 dimensional irreducible representation of SU2. And here are the rules for how you tensor and dualize those guys. They're all self-dual in this case. And if you tensor the spin j representation of the spin k, you get a direct sum of a bunch of representations going all the way from the absolute value of j minus k up to j plus k, but in integer steps, even though these j's are half integers, so it skips every other one. And so if you know these 
laws for how to tensor representations of SU2, then you can work out what these spaces of intertwiners are in this case. Here it's more complicated because this formula up here is more complicated. So the simple case to study is a trivalent vertex, which is again secretly related to Misha's talk that we'll eventually see. <laughs> so the space of intertwiners from the spin J representation to the spin K representation to the spin L representation will be one dimensional if L appears in this list somewhere, which means that these conditions hold. And it'll be zero dimensional if L doesn't appear in this list of numbers going from J minus K up to J plus K. So this J plus K plus L being a natural number is simply a slick way of saying we're jumping up here and making steps. This is the triangle inequality. So another way to say this constraint here is that you can draw a triangle whose sides have lengths J, K, and L. That'll ultimately be related to the geometric interpretation of this in terms of metrics, believe it or not. So anyway, you either get a one-dimensional or a zero-dimensional space of intertwiners in this particular trivalent case. So again, if we're smart enough to pick a canonical intertwiner, we don't even need to bother mentioning the intertwiner. Just pick that and use that one if it exists, if the space is one-dimensional. And don't even bother drawing this if, if it's zero-dimensional. We shouldn't be talking about that spin network yet. If the vertex has a higher valence, you can still use this technology to describe the basis of intertwiners. But here I drew a rather fancy vertex with a bunch of edges coming in and out, labeled by various spins. And to describe a basis of intertwiners for this vertex, we can do the following trick. We can imagine, don't really do it, just imagine doing it. We can imagine exploding this little vertex into a trivalent tree. So you can imagine, don't take it very literally, but you can imagine there's like an infinitesimal little trivalent tree at this vertex. And then by that trick, we've managed to reduce the general case to the trivalent case. We know that we can get an intertwining operator uh, to label this vertex by picking a particular trivalent tree and then labeling all the edges inside here with spins in a way which is compatible with these rules at each vertex. And if we go through all possible ways of labeling those internal edges of the trivalent tree, we'll pick out a basis of intertwiners. So that really just follows from this. So you know, we're saying the kind of thing I'm asserting here is that if you're trying to describe an intertwiner from a tensor product of three representations to one, you can always think of it as first an intertwiner from a tensor product of two to someone, and then the tensor product of that one to a third one. So you, or this is a simple example of this case of uh, busting this thing up into a trivalent tree. So you just pick one trivalent tree and you get all intertwiners by labeling the internal edges. If someone else picks up other trivalent tree, they will get a different basis of intertwiners. So, so these are the kind of spin networks that people first considered. Actually, the term spin network was invented by Penrose. You have to pick, you just have to pick one, you have to pick all You've got to pick one tree, and you get all intertwiners with that tree. If someone else picks some other tree, you will get a different basis of intertwiners. And you need them to figure out how to convert your basis to hits. So there's a technology for doing that as well. And is the structure of the isomorphism between these two bases? So, the yeah, yeah, that's what's actually on the slide that I'm showing at the very beginning of each talk. That's called the 6J symbols. So the main thing you need to know how to change basis is you need to know how to take this sort of intertwiner and rewrite it as a linear combination with some coefficients of this sort of intertwiner. Because if you know how to do this case, you can get from any trivalent tree with a fixed number of external edges to any other one by successive applications of this rule. And this, uh, well, this 
things, these coefficients are called the 6J symbols because you really need to have six spins labeling the whole picture. So, so it depends on all of those. I won't bother writing them in because I'll write them in the wrong order. But anyway, those are called the 6J symbols. And they were developed by chemists who are actually doing a lot of stuff a lot of quantum chemistry and needing to understand what happens when you have a lot of spin one half particles interacting, that is, electrons in your atom. And then it was only much later that it was discovered that they're good for all sorts of other things like quantum gravity um, and monoidal categories and things like that. So Penrose invented these, the term spin networks. He was considering only the case of a graph where all the vertices were trivalent, so that he didn't need to label these vertices by intertwiners. And he had this idea, I guess around 1970, that maybe if you were trying to come up with some discrete or quantum theory of what space was like, that you could use these spin networks to do it, without much of a justification for that, except that they had some nice formal properties. And so it came as a very pleasant surprise later on when people discovered that these spin networks arise naturally when you're trying to describe the basis of states in this sort of gauge theory that was discovered in the context of people working on quantum gravity, which was Penrose's original motivation. It was discovered by Ravelli and Smolin that these spin networks are a good, good thing for quantum gravity. I proved this theorem that they form a basis. OK, let's see. So that's it for gauge theory on a graph. Now what about gauge theory on a manifold? Let's see, did I skip a slide here? This looks wrong somehow. Can I say what M is? Sorry, I skipped this. That's right. So for technical reasons that you'll see at some point, I'm going to talk about a real analytic manifold. So we can do this stuff for a smooth one, it gets more fancy. So let M be a real analytic manifold, and I probably should have called it S, because in my conventions, S is space. So we're really thinking of this as space, not space-time. But anyway, let G be a compact connected Lie group. Pick a G bundle, P over M, and now let A mean something new. It's the space of smooth connections on this principal bundle. G now will be the smooth gauge transformations. And what we'd like to do is define L2 of the space of connections mod gauge transformations in this case. Well, this thing here is some kind of infinite dimensional variety, infinite dimensional manifold on an open dead set, but it has these singular points. So this is a very nasty big thing, and there's no known good measure on it. But what we're going to do is come up with a certain kind of completion of A and of G. And that will have a nice measure on it. So what we're going to do is we're going to construct some compact Hausdorff spaces, A bar and G bar. And there'll be natural maps including A and G into those. And A bar, this completion, it will have a well-defined Borel measure on it. And it will be invariant under the action of this gauge group G bar. And that will let us define L2 of A bar mod G bar. So I should point out that in quantum field theory, this is a very typical type of situation. That is, you would start out with a space of, say, smooth fields, and you'd like to define a measure on that. For example, in Misha's talk when he was going to the infinite dimensional context, he wrote down this thing, d phi times this exponential of a quadratic function of phi, you'd like to be able to make sense of that kind of Gaussian measure. And you can make sense of that kind of Gaussian measure, but it won't be a measure on the space of smooth fields. In fact, it will be a measure on some space of distributional fields. So it will be a measure on some larger space in which your original space of smooth fields is dense, but has measure zero. Uh, and so that's been learned over the years is the way things, is how things go. And so it should not be a surprise if you've seen all that 
stuff that we have to do that kind of trick here to uh, sort of really define L2 of A mod G. A gauge transformation, uh, it's, an, it's an automorphism of this bundle. So if you really, really know what a bundle is, you'll know what a symmetry of a bundle is. And that's what a gauge transformation is. That's one definition. <laughs> so um, if the bundle P is a trivial G bundle, a gauge transformation is just a smooth function from M to G that rotates each fiber, so to speak, by that element of G. Um, smooth means infinitely differentiable with continuous derivatives all along. Very, very, very smooth. Yeah, that's right. So, that's right. Okay, whoops. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, first what we do is we look at all possible graphs stuck inside our manifold M. So I hope you can guess what I mean by a graph with edges real analytically embedded in M. So they're, the edges are, they were abstract combinatorial objects, but now we're going to think of them as actually copies of the interval, and they will be mapped into M, embedded, in fact, by real analytic maps. And when I say embedded, I include the fact that I don't want two different edges to cross each other. So it's the the graph is embedded. Sorry? No, oh. the edges of the entire graph. Yeah, I should have said the whole graph is embedded. Yeah, you know what? Right, yeah, well, yeah, that's right. That's because I was getting nervous trying to see how I could say this without getting too detailed, but right. Yeah. You know what I mean by a whole graph real analytically embedded in M, that's what I mean. <laughs> so but each edge is real analytically embedded, there are no intersections. So now, given such a thing, we can think of that as a way of sort of getting a little view of what a connection does. So we've got a connection on this manifold, and I stick a graph in the manifold, and you can see we'll be able to learn a little bit about the connection just from looking at its holonomies along those edges, which will be a bunch of group elements, at least if we trivialize the bundle at each point, at each vertex there. So that's the idea. So we'll let change our notation a little bit, let A sub gamma be the space of connections on this graph as we defined it uh, before in this talk. The G sub gamma be the gauge transformations associated to that graph. And now maybe I'll make up a name for the measure that we talked about. I'll call it mu sub gamma. That will be the measure on A sub gamma. So now if I trivialize the bundle at each point of the manifold in a discontinuous way if I need to, then I'll get maps, which will be onto from A to A sub gamma and from G to G sub gamma. So what are these maps? Well, this map I already mentioned. It takes any connection here and spits out the list of holonomies of that connection along all these edges, a bunch of group elements. What's this map? Well, this is even easier. I take this gauge transformation and I evaluate it at each vertex of the graph and get a group element. Think of it as a group element because we've trivialized P at each point separately. So we have these natural maps from the situation we're trying to understand to the situation that we already did understand, and that's the way we're going to attack this problem. And so the idea is we're going to form these completions, A bar and G bar, as a kind of inverse limit over all graphs of these spaces associated to the graphs. So there will be very big spaces. So the way to form that limit is to notice that if you look at all the graphs real analytically embedded in our manifold, there's a, actually a category of them where, loosely speaking, the morphisms of that category are ways of including one graph inside another. So you should think of this as a little portion of this bigger graph here. A little more precisely, the morphisms are products of these morphisms here. You're allowed to add new edges and new vertices. So for example, here we've added some new, a new edge and two new vertices. 
We can also add new vertices in a way which subdivides an existing edge. So, for example, going from here to here, I've added a new vertex. And you're also allowed to turn around the orientations of edges, like I did, say, oh, I don't know, here to here. So any composite of these processes will think of as a morphism from one graph to another. But the you like the identity morphism? I don't know what you mean by like plus inclusion. Well, that's including that's the first one. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. So we get a category this way. It's almost like a partially ordered set. It's just a little bit more fancy because it's reversing orientations of edges gives you morphisms from a graph to itself. So if we have a way of including some graph gamma and some bigger graph gamma prime, then we automatically get some maps going backwards from the space of connections on the big graph to the space of connections on the little graph and also for the gauge transformation. So for example, this map here, you would just say, how does it work? Well, an element of A gamma prime just assigns a group element to each of these edges, and that will determine an assignment to each of these edges of a group element. If each one of these is a group element, if we reverse an orientation, we need to take the inverse of the uh, group element. We've got a bunch of edges subdivided. We need to multiply those group elements and their inverses appropriately to get the group element for this guy. So basically, I'm just saying that if you know the holonomies of a connection along all these edges, you can work out what the holonomies are along all those edges, and that tells you this map. And it's even easier for the gauge transformations because the vertices here are a subset of the vertices here. And so these maps, which I'm calling F pullback, are nice in every possible way. So they're, these guys were measure spaces. They also had a topology because they're a product of copies of a compact group. And so these maps are measure preserving and they're continuous and they're onto, and these are onto homomorphisms of Lie groups. So all the structure is getting preserved by these maps. And so that lets us take this, uh, take these inverse limits and form A bar and G bar. So the idea is that the inverse limit of A bar, for example, will be some big space equipped with maps down to all of these spaces A sub gamma, which has the property that all possible diagrams you can draw using arrows I told you about commute. So for example, you can map down to A sub gamma prime and then to prove this theorem that I want to remark is that if you have any two graphs sitting inside your manifold, real analytically embedded in your manifold, you can find some bigger graph that includes both of them. So you can form that bigger graph by just popping these two down on top of each other and subdividing edges if necessary, where, where, where edges happen to intersect, stick in the vertices. That's where you use real analytics. Right. And that's where I, the real analyticity comes into play. This little lemma here would not be true in the smooth category if I had a smooth manifold and maps of smooth edges and smooth maps of edges into it, the following nasty type of thing could happen. I could have two smoothly embedded graphs. So these are two graphs that just have one edge and two vertices each. And I plop them down on top of each other, and they intersect in a canter set. And there's no way to subdivide them by adding finitely many new vertices to get a graph. So that's why the real analyticity comes in handy. Nonetheless, actually, everything I said in this theorem is true also in the smooth category. It's just a lot harder to prove. So you can construct these spaces with all these properties in the smooth category. It seeps on, and I did that a while back. And uh, it just gets a lot harder. It's the proof makes you feel like you're playing around with spaghetti because you're trying to understand all the possible ways a bunch of smooth curves can intersect and they can be quite nasty. Yeah? Do these inclusions preserve the topology? So for example, uh, connection modulo gauge, uh, including it for the orbit of these inclusions that a homotopy equivalence? Homotopy equivalence? Or is it something about the topology? Um, uh, no, I don't think anything like that. They're continuous maps, but I think that's about all you can say. So basically, this, you should think of this space and this space as being a whole lot like 
a huge, uncountable product of copies of G. It's That's not true. quite that, but it's a little bit like that. Normally, you think of the uh, gauge group as the, like the space of maps from your manifold to the right. lead group. Does this G, have that kind of G bar has a nice, simple description. It's, it's, it's just the space of all maps, not necessarily smooth, from your manifold to the gauge group. Well, that's for a trivial problem. So, not necessarily continuous, not necessarily measurable, not necessarily anything. Okay, it just maps, yeah, so that's big, it's big. Yeah, it's a big group. Nonetheless, it's compact, right? By, <laughs> by, by uh, ticking off steering, yeah, ticking off steering. There's some big, compact spaces around here. So this is, yeah, this is fairly wild stuff. It's like large spaces we've got here. Um, <coughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know how nice. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. If, that's a good point. I don't know if you can make it much nicer. That would be interesting. If you have two different manifolds, are the Hilbert spaces you get? Are the are the space of connections? Or what are the spaces different for different maps? Well, different. Let's see. That's a very subtle term. So, um, certainly the gauge groups are the G bars are the same. You can establish a bijection between the set of points of any two respectable manifold, an uncountable set of points, continuums worth, and then you get a group homomorphism between them. So they're the same in that sense. I don't write yeah, them about people. There has to be some topology in the, the edges and the, uh, the relation of the edges and the vertices. To, to define the, well, the action of, yeah, so I mean, the, the action of G bar on A bar involves the relations between the edges and the vertices. That's true. Yeah? You mentioned that uh, it's just a set of all maps. No, it doesn't really matter anymore if it's trivial. Model. So what we've done here is we've actually done things that make topologists very unhappy. You have people who wanted to understand the topology of bundles and will now be unhappy because you, know, you can show that for any principal bundle P over your manifold M, as long as it has the same gauge, you'll get isomorphic a bars and G bars. So the topology of the bundle is lost. We don't retain any information about that by the time we form this huge completion. That's right. That's right. And so, well, so at this point you have to decide, do I really, really believe that space is a smooth manifold and that all these topologies of bundles are really fundamentally what's going on in physics or not? You'll notice one thing in, in a well, in, in certain calculations of quantum field theory, when you do half integrals and gauge theory, you have to sum over all bundles. It's like called summing over different instanton numbers. So in fact, in quantum field theory, you actually often do not really fix a particular bundle, but sort of go over all bundles. So it's not quite as crazy as it might, as it might seem to be doing this. But then, yeah, this is an interesting issue. So, in the real analytic case, as a corollary of all this stuff we've shown, L2 of A bar mod G bar will have an orthonormal basis of spin networks. So a spin network consists now of the following data. The gamma ranges over all graphs analytically embedded in our manifold, but we want to get an orthonormal basis, we don't want to double count uh, states. So we, we don't want to have graphs that have just a lone vertex floating off by itself without any edges. We don't want to have graphs that have vertices sitting along a, uh, a real analytic edge. And we don't want to have redundancies of various sorts. For example, if we have a real analytic loop, we don't want to 
take both this graph and this graph, which is that loop made into a graph by picking the vertex in two different ways. So you just kind of pick one in this kind of situation. And similarly, only pick one orientation for, for each edge. Because you'll get the same states in L2 of A bar mod G bar for each of these two graphs. So there's a, if you want to get an orthonormal basis, you don't want to use both. So you have to randomly pick one. So you, can you throw away the mark point on that circle? Another way to think about it is that yeah, you just ignore mark points on a circle and you ignore orientations. So, you, so a vertex is only the one that you would see because of the topology of the graph. Yeah, that's another way to say it, say what's going on here. That's right. Uh, the, the real analytic structure, you have a corner. At a corner, you better put a vertex, that's right. At a place where it's not real analytic. So similarly, to get an orthonormal basis, we want to label the edges by non-trivial irreducible representations. You can see that if you let yourself use trivial ones, you could have used a smaller graph without that edge. Uh, and iota ranges over labelings of vertices, as before, by intertwiners going from a chosen from an orthonormal basis of intertwiners from this tensor product of incoming edges to the tensor product of outgoing edges. So this theorem here is not true in the smooth case. You can get all the, you can get states from smooth <coughs> networks in the smooth category, but they're not, you don't get enough to completely span this space. So, so Steve Sahn and I worked out what kind of things you need to deal with the smooth case, you need to deal with things that are a little bit more wild than graphs. We call them webs. So they can have edges that intersect each other infinitely often and things like that in a certain restricted way. That gets sort of technical. So I guess I'll stop here. So we're going to use this technology next time to uh, study the case of quantum gravity where we have a three manifold and SU2 is our group. Let's see how far it gets us. OK, thanks. Yeah, I don't have a good answer to that sort of question 
don't know if it captures them. So one can also introduce on this space the even the Gaussian measures because one has to be Yeah. And that measure does have a response to both. I mean, the measure that John has to introduce is remarkably random. It's a very good information about metric one. It just knows what the matter is. And then it kind of goes from the Gaussian measures have information also about the uh, about the metric. So uh, you are doing natural theory what that's going to be a big classic space and then you go to that to so get the structure of space. Yeah, that's... Did you read the comment? Uh, well, so, so recently people have used this technology to study um, vacuum Maxwell equations, quantized vacuum Maxwell theory, one angles there. And, uh, and there you get measures associated to that theory, which which have information about the metric on the math board. So there you have to fix a metric in order to do your electromagnetism, magnetism, and you get some interesting measures to, to know a lot about that metric. So for a long time, people were sort of mystified about this approach to gauge theory because they didn't even know how to do this, the simplest gauge theory, namely vacuum Maxwell's equations in this formalism. But recently, Madhavan Bharadarajan has figured out how to do that. And it, so the usual Fox space approach to, to uh, vacuum QED, that is QED without charged particles, can also be described as L2 of A mod G for a certain choice of measure on A mod G. So, um, so it's, we're, we're just beginning to understand how this new approach to gauge theory relates to other older approaches. Yeah, so you can take, there are a lot of functions on A mod G, the smooth A mod G, which are just take the holonomy of a connection along some edge, calculate some number from that in a continuous way. You get a whole community of C star algebra of functions on A mod G that way. Completed the form of community of C star algebra. And the spectrum of that C star algebra is this A bar mod G bar. So that's another analytical analysis flavored way of constructing this space. So this space can be constructed in actually quite a number of different ways. So I'm going to make some Xerox uh, copies of John's uh, overhead. Great. So, in order not to waste paper, I'll put up a sign-up sheet by the, by the registration desk. Uh, maybe after, maybe tomorrow, I'll look how many names there are, maybe any options. Okay, great. Thanks. Any more questions? Yeah. So, I'm curious about the role of the process of the analysis here. That's the last one. Uh-huh. Like, there's a minor approximation. linear approach, for example. I'll talk a little bit about that. So one can also do that if people have done that. And that's nice too. So you can, if you take, if you take a, a triangulation of a manifold or some other kind of piecewise linear decomposition of a manifold, you can associate a graph to it, which would be, say, the one skeleton of that. And you can define connections, modulation, transformations on that graph. And then you can do the same kind of inverse limit Using refinement of uh, the triangulations, and that's 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 been worked out too. It's, I sort of like that better myself in some ways. So one of the interesting things about this is that we have physicists working on this approach, who are arguing about whether space-time should be a real analytic manifold or a smooth manifold or a piecewise linear manifold. Um, and actually, I mean, I think that kind of question really, although it seems sort of uh, and even for mathematicians, it's hard to believe that you can really care about those kind of things in physics, I think, sometimes. But I think if you're trying to understand space-time on its smallest distance scales, those types of issues actually do matter. And here, one way we're seeing it matter is that we can define L2 of A bar mod G bar in either the real analytic category, the smooth category, 
by the piecewise linear category. And they work out rather differently, although somewhat the same in each case. And certain, some things work out more conveniently in one case, some work out more conveniently in another case. Lately, I'm a piecewise linear fan, uh, but, but other people who are more eager to maintain a connection to the differential equation aspect of general relativity would be leaning towards a smooth or real analytic uh, setting. And so we're just arguing about it, fighting it out, but the different approaches are there. There's a question. It, well, it, it, it must, it does in some sense come up because it, that determines things like which paths are smooth or which paths are real analytic. We haven't done any fun calculations where we've let two differentiable structures fight against each other and see if you get different answers or some problem. So it, I don't have anything exciting to say about that, but it doesn't matter. But I mean, you could say the dimension four of the smooth structure is determined by the common rule. Yeah, that's, that's so, true. Yeah, that's, that's right, that's right. Working. So in that crucial dimension, right, we have a certain way of I mean, one avoiding one is unnecessary is arguments. Right. The basic cosmology of the common control structure is important. That's the dramatic development. If you notice things in the common control through the real analytic in terms of the moral significance of the structure, all those are at one level cosmology that are Right. Yeah. We've learned. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And there's also a theorem that any smooth manifold can be given a real analytic yeah, right. structure in essentially one way. So there. Yeah. So in some senses, the differences aren't as big. They might seem. Nothing too interesting, I guess. So then there just would be one connection. So A mod G bar would be one point, L2 of it would be the complex numbers. It would be. No, it would be, yeah, you wouldn't get much out of that. Any more questions? Okay, perfect.